And I think we were on a we were on a car, long car ride. And Zach goes, you know what? And I was like, you know, what if we faked our own deaths while we were pitching? <laughs> this is Adam Stein. And he's telling us the story of how he and his directing partner, Zach Lepofsky, landed the job directing the upcoming Final Destination 6. I don't know how many um, of your listeners know kind of how directors get hired. Mm. Well, I, one of your, we don't, I don't know. I'm yeah. not one of the hosts. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, a lot of people who are in the, even people who are in the industry kind of assume that like the directors are there from the beginning. Because when most people get hired, there's already a director. So they never see right. the moment where the director was hired. But directors basically have to audition, just like actors. Um, whoever is in charge of hiring the director, whether it's the producers or the studio or the financiers, will meet lots of directors and hear their pitch, hear their thoughts on the movie and how they would make it if they were the director. And it's it's the directors dancing for their meal, right. you know, to try to get hired over, over many callbacks and all that stuff. So we were doing that for, for Final Destination. <laughs> and then I think we were on a, we were on a car, long car ride. And Zach goes, you know what? And I was like, you know, what if we faked our own deaths while we were pitching? Uh, because it's all about insane, you know, Rue Goldberg situations happening where where people die. And and Adam was like, well, how would we do that? That's impossible. And we slowly built this incredibly elaborate plan that ended up taking days of effort. Um, where from the perspective of the people watching, we were pitching, and then uh, Adam's living room lit on fire, and then a ceiling fan <laughs> fell off the ceiling and chopped his head off and sprayed all his blood all over the sc the screen and uh and i survived <laughs> and then uh and everyone just like could not believe what they were seeing at the end of our pitch amazing how long did it take you to make that film like you shot you, you literally made a short well film. basically we did it in 24 hours because we wanted the sun to be in exactly the same position wow. Wow, um detail. so we were we were we recorded it exactly at the time we would be pitching the next day. So cool. Um, so that the switch between pre-recorded and live footage would be unnoticeable. Um, and so then we had to do all the visual effects and gags and all that stuff in those 24 hours before the pitch. Getting hired as a director is a huge challenge. But it's one we don't have to worry about. We've already landed the gig. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This is great. We're really excited to do this. That's right. Maddie Ryan and I are planning to co-direct our short horror film as a trio. But now comes the real challenge. Actually directing it. And also figuring out what a director does. And also, how do you do it? And also, are we sure all three of us can do it? And also, how do we make it scary? And also, it's Let's Make a Horror. Hitchcock, Craven, Carpenter. These are all names that are synonymous with horror. Actually, Carpenter is synonymous with woodworking. But I digress. They're all horror directors. And we're going to find out what it takes to direct horror. But first, here's where we're at. A few weeks from now, oh God, a few weeks from now, We'll be shooting our short horror film, Close and Lock the Patio Door. You already know the plot. Ryan plays an alcoholic movie director drying out at his agent's holiday cabin. Maddie is the nosy cabin caretaker. And I'm the monster who shows up in the middle of the night and Ryan tries to keep me from coming in the patio door. That's the plot you heard in the original pitch. But now that we've been actually writing it, here's what's changed. Ryan is no longer a director. He's just a guy named Hugo who got drunk and embarrassed himself at a wedding. And instead of starting the movie with a call from his agent, we hear the sounds of him ruining the wedding. We see him pulling up to a cabin. He gets an angry text from a friend. He informs the friend he's going out of town for a few days. He finds a can of bear spray on the counter and some alcohol in the fridge. 
He's startled when Maddie's friendly caretaker character throws some towels at the window. He meets her and her dog outside and asks her if there are any bears in the area. She tells him there's nothing to worry about. And so he's alone. He putters, he cooks, he smokes. He doesn't drink the alcohol. But then he gets more angry texts from friends. So he says, screw it. He makes a martini and falls asleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night to get a glass of water, walks past the patio door, and the monster's face is pressed up to the glass, but Hugo doesn't see it. The monster tries to open the patio door but can't do it, so he gives up and leaves. Moments later, Hugo comes back. He heard something. He looks out the patio door, grabs the can of bear spray, and walks out onto the patio. Out of the darkness, something leaps out at him. It's the dog he met earlier. He goes back inside and starts sliding the door shut. But a hand grabs the handle from outside. It's the monster. Hugo struggles to push the door closed, while the monster calmly tries to push it open. They stay like this for some time, until Hugo manages to get the door shut. He locks it and collapses into a chair. The next morning, he's packing up and getting ready to leave. The caretaker knocks on the patio door. Hugo lets her in. She's her usual friendly self, but she tells him he can't leave. And then? Well, actually, we wrote three alternate endings. It's creepy, and it has three endings, which is great to choose from. That's Eduardo Sanchez. You may remember him from episode one. He's the co-writer and co-director of the Blair Witch Project. He kindly offered to give us notes on our script. He spoke to Ryan and our producer, Chris. No, I thought it was really, I mean, you know, I was impressed, you know? I was, uh, it's, it, you know, it's going to make a nice little okay. film. Sick, great, done. I think we can probably just put a stamp on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a few notes. Lay it on us. I have a question. I read it a few times and I said, like I said, I think it like makes a lot of sense. I think it's a really good little, again, like it's a perfect little horror film. I think people are going to love it. Um, but what is like, what, what in your opinion is the thing that is this thing that's, you know, like, what is this ghoul? What is it? Great question. What we're kind of playing around with right now is it's, it's a, it's a, it's a personal demon. It's uh because uh, we, we've, I think we floated in that they, they're Mark and I don't look dissimilar. Mark's going to play this dark figure. I'm going to play Hugo, and so it's sort of like with some costuming and maybe a little bit of makeup that it's sort of a version, the bad version of him that he's kind of on the run from. That like sort of uh, the idea being that you, you, you can't, you can only run away for so long until you face the problems or your personal demons. So he's kind of trying to run away from it. So that's. That's the idea we have floating around right now. Is it sort of a personal demon? Right, right, right. Um, like, how do you want us to feel at the end of this movie? Like, do you mm. want us, like, like he deserves it? Because I think that, like, mm. you don't get enough. Like, you obviously know that he's ruined this wedding and he's probably yeah. ruined a bunch of things and he's alcoholic. But you never see yeah. him, like, take any kind of, like, responsibility or, like, I don't know how you feel. You know what I mean? Or even, like some regret at the end. What, like, what's the lesson? You know what I mean? That's a really good question. I, and I, I don't think we've ever really kind of addressed that. How do we want to feel at the end of the movie about his fate? Like, and I guess that'll sort of inform also how we feel about him during the whole thing. I, I feel like, like if you have something there where like, like Ebenezer Scrooge, like at the end, Oh fuck, you're right. I had a terrible, I've had a terrible life. I've tortured everybody. I'm going to change. Yeah. Like for me, I was looking for that moment and that, that would be like, I think people would leave like an emotional connection I uh, you know, and, and the creepy connection. I think that's what would make it a big, a big difference. I oh, think that's dope. You know? That's a great, that's great. So that was my kind of my general note. Yeah. Uh, then I have just little suggestions and little kind of things. Like I think that first of all, texts are always tough as you guys, yeah, right. you, know, you got to keep them short because people don't like to read. And even the, you know, like you gotta, you have to direct the text, you know, really well. And also like it, you have to set up because there's a moment later on 
when the when he sees the the dark figure for the first time, mm-hmm. like face to face with it. Yeah. Right there, I wrote he would try to call nine one one or yes. somebody. Right. I mean, yes. you're in a fucking cabin and somebody's trying to break in. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna be like, at least try it. And so, so you need to set up something about the cell phone, yeah. whether it's comes and goes. And I think you can set it up here where he gets to the cabin and he like checks his texts. And I think it would be cool if you showed like 10 fucking texts of like, yeah. what the fuck is your problem? You act like, I can't believe you did like, just, just, you know, you scroll yes. through and then at the end, and then he answers one or whatever, but just something where like the, the reception goes in and out or whatever. I love that. You know? Yes. And I asked a question, what's, is there significance to the towels? Oh, I am not really. We just we we kind of learned the layout of the the cabin we've rented, uh-huh. and there's no there's no the patio is like a patio with no stairs down, and so we just thought we used to have a scene where she came up and knocked on the patio door, but now that there's no stairs, we're like, oh, that's maybe she's quirky and she tosses up the towels that you might need when you're renting an Airbnb. So there's no real significance other than it's not a rock. <laughs> it wouldn't break the glass or whatever. I felt that like the intro to this could be a little creepier. And yes. I felt the towels were like, like, okay, if it's the demon, what the demon threw towels, like it just, I'm saying yeah. it's, it's just yeah, one of these yeah. things where like it, it, it gets rid of the creepiness of it. Where yeah. it's like, if it's like, I don't know what it is, like something like symbolic or from the woods or something weird. And you're like strange like, and like, yeah, a little like, witchy. Little, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like he's she's almost like some kind of test or something where he she's testing the waters. And and I think that this is you want this to be really creepy. A hundred percent. And yeah, it's interesting yeah. with short films sometimes like you don't realize like. You know, because we have such little time, everything takes yeah. on a bit more meaning. You know what I mean? Everything, like, what, Matt, everything, what is yeah, that? Everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I think that you know, you're in this cabin. You got one car basically, and yeah. and a few characters, and that's it. You know what I mean? So, I don't think I think you guys are in good shape All because right. you know because you don't have anything like you know. There's no like, oh, his head gets ripped off and his arms crawl across by themselves, or you know, what I'm saying like. There's nothing crazy here other than the, the you know, the makeup on the on the goo on the demon has to be fucking crazy. You know yeah, what I'm it does. Yeah, that's got to look good. Cool. Amazing. I think invaluable. Invaluable. We thank appreciate you. this so much. This is so oh. generous of you and kind. And like, yes. just so thank yeah. Yeah. No, man. Anytime. I mean, you know, I, I love, uh, uh, you know, I, I love the script. And I, I mean, luckily it was good because sometimes you like. <laughs> Thank God. You were, I think I would have been like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little too busy for this. I'm a little busy. <laughs> so the writing is coming along nicely. But as you know, we're not just writing this film. We're also directing it. All three of us. And when we brought this idea up to Ronnie Chang in our last episode... He said this. I mean, who's directing this? Your, your horror movie. We're going to have to, we, we've decided that we're going to self-direct it. So I don't know what that means. Is like By a, committee? Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't do know. I don't okay, know. well, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. By committee? Yeah. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. When the barbarians were at the gate, the Romans appointed one <laughs> emperor. Yeah. Not a committee. So when we got back into the writer's room, we talked about how this would actually work. We're going to be making this horror film, and and originally, and maybe still, we I've decided that we're all going to direct it. A group directing project. Group directing project. The three of us are directing. That's like that's like what's happening right now. A la mama. Yeah, but what do we think? What is the job of director? Where mm. like that's our producer Dave. What does a director do? So a director is responsible for a visual vision. So they in prep are going to make lists and get people that they know to execute that vision. And then on set, they have to set up the blocking in the shot and the the way that it's going to be filmed, Mm -hmm. even though the cinematographer is going to have a lot of back and forth with them about like the lighting and whatever to Mm -hmm. achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. And we'll obviously be giving us on performing of the actors. Yes. Things Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They they know how to delegate what needs to Mm -hmm. happen. And in my case, if I, if you guys are like, Mark, you're directing, I'd be like, well, Who's shooting this? Because I need to 
have a very close relationship to a really good cinematographer. Which we might not have. Which we might not have. Which and, we might not have. Yeah, like, and, then, and, then, and then we you know, figure it out from there. In my opinion, mm -hmm. it might be good to delineate the roles. Someone is the writer. Someone is the director. Mm. And someone is the producer. That's really interesting. There's literally just workflow elements yeah. to who is answering to who, whose call is what. Like, when you make a movie, there's like a lot of stuff that has to be done. Mm -hmm. And I don't, like, you know, we're going to need shot lists and mm -hmm. what is it called when you Storyboard. write? Storyboards. Storyboards yeah. and, like, But I would want to put that all on one person. Like, the job of directing is so massive, even for a rinky-dink thing like this. Mm -hmm. But it is more massive if every single person has to agree on every single thing. Mm -hmm. It's a bigger job right. if we all have to do it. I it's don't know if it is. I, I disagree. I mean, I'd be fine with it, but, like, we're all going to be in it. We're all going to be in it, man. Yeah, we're all going to be in it. I just, I, I, I would feel I want to be involved in shots. I want to be involved in shot lists. I want to be involved in the right. writing. Okay. I want to be involved in the producing. And I would feel it wouldn't be as fun to relinquish all of that just yet. Yeah. I just feel like at the end of the day, doesn't someone need to make a call? Doesn't someone need to say, this is the shot? Yeah. Not, yes. You know? Clearly, we don't know what we want to do about directing. I think a lot of our doubts about doing it as a group seems to be coming from a logistical standpoint. How do we execute on the day if every decision has to go through three people? So we decided to talk to Adam Stein and Zach Lepofsky, a directing team that has been working together since they met as contestants on a reality show in 2007. It was this show called On the Lot that was basically a reality television show where Spielberg was looking for filmmakers to make short films live on television, similar to uh, American Idol, but with filmmaking, where you had to make a different short film every week and America would vote the loser <laughs> off. And uh, on the very, very, very first episode, where there was the top 50 audition episode, Adam and I became roommates. The casting director thought we would get along. From that point on, we kind of, Survivor was big at the time. We're like, let's make an allegiance. <laughs> let's like, let's help each other. Uh, and we made uh, the first challenge was to make a short film in 24 hours, uh, which we we did together with another friend of ours. And uh, from there, kind of just helped and support each other through the insanity of being on a reality television show as contestants against each other and uh, and created, a you know, an incredible friendship. And from there, um, started directing separately, but eventually over time started doing small stuff together, more short films, web series, and eventually started making movies together. They made their first feature film together in 2018, a movie called Freaks, in which our own Ryan Beale gets stabbed in the eye by Academy Award nominee Bruce Dern and then riddled with bullets. Uh, could I borrow your pen? <sighs> yeah, of course, absolutely. Ah! Ah! No, no! Uh, some people call it horror. It was more of a genre mashup, sci-fi <laughs> horror thriller thing. I mean, Ryan does get stabbed brutally in the eye with a pen. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's true. And then shot by a SWAT team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole reason Ryan Beale gets stabbed in the eye in Freaks is that Adam has a huge phobia of stuff around mm -hmm. his eyes. Me too. Like oh. contact contact lenses, any like eye drops. So, like, I can't even do it. When I have an eyelash in my eye, I like yeah. freak out. Yeah. And so all the eye stuff and freaks came from that kind of cringy eye Your stuff. personal fear that you can't. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I was also worried Bruce Turner was going to actually stab me in the eye because he was angry that day. <laughs> He's very unpredictable. Um, you could tell that to Ryan and, now. And he, was, he was also kind of having a bad day that day. So anything's a terrible day. <laughs> um, it's just him and I alone in this kitchen of the diner. I'm like, okay, where? How are you holding that pen, Bruce? Like, let it show it to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there a template for a certain horror genre? Like, are there are there things? That, that kind of need to happen. Yeah, I think it's tough because in all genre, genre basically is a set of expectations. Mm -hmm. That's what genre, any genre is, right? Even in rom coms or sci fi, there's there's a when you are watching a genre picture, you are sort of coming into it with a set of expectations. But the trick of it is 
you need to both meet those expectations, but also subvert them and surprise the audience, right? If you just give them exactly what the formula mm. requires, you will have checked all the boxes, but it'll be boring and uninventive and uninteresting. There's all these little ingredients that make up genre and horror. And usually um, what where people find creativity, I think, is they often will take a lot of the conventions and then dramatically shift one of them. That's often where innovation comes from is like you'll have the conventions you're used to and then one of them is completely flipped on its head and no one's ever flipped that convention on its head mm -hmm. before. And that leads to a completely new way of experiencing that type of genre. Um, <laughs> so I just want to get really nuts and boltsy yeah. here. Like, Let's do it. How, like, how do you make a scary scene? Like, how do you shoot something scary? Like, how do you, how do you create tension mm -hmm. and like with the camera, <laughs> with, like, yeah. like literally what do you do? <laughs> like, what are the dials you're twisting, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's kind of this famous quote that I'm not going to try and quote, but where Hitchcock talks about the difference between surprise and suspense mm. um, that you've probably heard before. But he talks about if the, if you watch a scene where there's two people talking, sitting at a table for five minutes, and then a bomb explodes and they die. That would be surprising. <laughs> uh, but if you reimagine that scene where the camera shows that there's a bomb under the table. Right. And then they talk for five minutes. You will be on the edge of your seat in suspense because you sort of are aware that something bad is going to happen and you're anticipating and, and on the edge of your seat as to when, when is this pot going to boil right. over? Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do that. Either through the, the character's perspective of something, they see a door creak and, and slightly open when it shouldn't have. Um, and that character is terrified of that. Another way is that the audience sees, you know, someone in the back of the frame standing there and the character hasn't seen that person yet. That also creates a, a feeling of suspense. So it's, it's playing with what the audience is anticipating is going to happen and what they're worried about happening and drawing that out. It's like an elastic band. The more you yeah. can draw it out and keep their attention and keep stretching it and keep making them think something bad's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen. I know something bad's going to happen. And then you release it. No, it's not that. Oh no, it's something that's even worse than I thought it could. And you got to get, keep playing that, that evolution. That was great advice. Yeah, that was very, yeah. very good. Huge. Um, right now we are planning on all directing this and, and nice. being in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you two work together as directors and like what what roles you take? And what are and the benefits of, of collaborative directing versus yeah. solo? It takes a lot of practice, I think, to, to do it well. Um, and I think that there are so many benefits. We both directed separately before we started working together. And so we both have, you know, clear ideas of what how it should be. And we overlap 90, 95% of the time mm -hmm. of like, Ooh, that's a great idea. You know, we get to build on each other and use who, the best idea of whoever came up with it. And in that five to 10% of time where we don't see it the same way, it's, it's really fascinating because usually it means there's a third idea that's, that's better than what any, what either of us came up with on our own and through talking it out oh why'd you see it that way oh that's interesting i i thought about this because this moment for me is really about that it's also usually the case that when we disagree it's usually that there's a root problem mm. that that's deeper yeah. like that there's something wrong with the scene that could have led to us both seeing it so differently mm. or that choice so differently or whatever the specific thing is and so it's often good to step back and be like okay well why are we seeing this so differently What's important to you? What's important to me? Why is this being interpreted differently? Because theoretically, if all the foundation is in the right place, maybe it wouldn't be. And so it's often stepping back and then also looking for that third option, like Adam was saying. I, I think the, the biggest challenge that I've seen other um, partnerships kind of uh, suffer from is related to ego, where when some somebody wants it to be their idea because it was their idea, mm -hmm. 
yeah. and or they feel hurt that the other person didn't like their idea. Oh, that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 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 leads to bad stuff because <laughs> you really have to, you know, kind of practice your your Zen to let let it go because really it's all in service of making the product as good as it can be. Mm. You got to just be oh, okay. That's interesting. Zach didn't like what I said there. Okay. Well, I wonder why. I wonder why he yeah. wants it this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe there's another way to do it. Yeah. Right. Like he probably thinks I'm like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but the benefit, as we've experienced through many projects, is that the ideas are so much better. Mm-hmm. Now, there is one pitfall that uh, you guys should be very aware of, especially when you're starting out, which is the crew and everyone around you is looking for every opportunity to say, you know, Mark walks up to someone and says, hey, that wall is going to be blue. And then they start painting it blue. And then Ryan walks past the wall and goes, what are you idiots doing? (laughs) That wall was supposed to be red. And they look for every opportunity to say, oh, well, Mark told me, oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. And so like they're, because they're, so they're constantly looking for like, the di- the difference in opinion between the right. between the group bec- because they're used to having one singular voice right. right and then you know there's another superpower which is when things go horribly wrong and what you planned is awful and you're watching it going <laughs> oh boy we thought this was going to be great but this is just the worst thing i've ever seen normally when you're a single director and i know some of you guys are actors the director will silently do that. They will just sort of, they will sit. They'll be, uh, they'll be sitting in their chair going, that's great. That's great. Oh my God, this is terrible. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. yeah. And they'll, they'll often just say, let's, let's go again, <laughs> which just gives them another like three or four minutes on the next take to continue to think about what the hell to do. Um, oh, is, is that what everyone's doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or exactly. And so we have the superpower and you guys will as well when something's not working to sort of have that sidebar, right. um, having that person to bounce ideas off of in the middle of a crisis is, yeah. is ma- massively yeah. helpful. But you guys have something that no one else has, which is the army of people who love let's make a something. <laughs> you know? So you need, to, you need to call upon your army of, <laughs> of loyal followers to come and make this, uh, this horror film with you. You could have 100 people die on camera, you know, show, showing up. Yeah, you got to take man. advantage. This is the specific advice that we want. We, th- these ideas are <laughs> like exactly yeah. what we want. The, the thing with horror films is people love to be involved with them. Like, when I was making a, a zombie film called Dead Rising, we needed you know hundreds and hundreds of zombies, but couldn't afford hundreds and hundreds of zombies and put the call out there. And the amount of people that want to be a zombie is pretty insane. And they showed up. This is a normal film set with millions of dollars. They showed up in makeup and costume and in character and did not break character all day and we would be like, where's we'd crafty be like, <laughs> exactly and they the ad's would be like all right zombies like come to set and they would like slowly shuffle to set having not broken is there bathroom. an on-set bathroom <laughs> <laughs> why is there no brains at crafty <laughs> do you think that there's like with with the horror genre though because people love to be involved do you think like Beyond, like, is there something about a horror movie that inspires people? Like, I want to be in, a, like, it's like the punk rock album. And what is it like, sort of, sort of thing? Like, I think it's just stuff? fun. It's it's yeah. sort of like you you get to you get to just you know it's it, it's fun. It's silly. People like uh, the campiness of it sometimes. Um, and the other thing is that horror is a really smart genre for you guys to make your first film in because low budget is acceptable. You know, if you were if you were making a uh, period costume drama, and or um, or even a, a sci-fi film, yes, you know, there's a sort of different, I don't know, uh, consideration of the campiness of doing low budget. Mm-hmm. But with horror, it's proven time and time again that it can work with with no money. Um, okay. It's just it all depends on what your concept is, what your what your script requires. Of that. Another another great area to look for inspiration is thinking of horror as uh, what it can ruin. So if you think of things like Jaws ruined swimming. Oh, (laughs) right. Basically, you know, it ruined clowns. 
um, The Shining ruined hotels. Dad. I don't know. Like, but <laughs> thinking of the, yeah. <laughs> Dad. Psycho yeah. ruined uh, showers. Writing, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> think, think like horror. And what that means is you're sort of tapping into something that is very relatable that lots of people do and experience, but find the way to twist it so that they can never do that thing again without thinking about uh, the way that you ruined it for them for the rest of their lives. <laughs> I love that. I, I love, love that, that too. It's true I love because so there much. is that final destination with the, I think it's like a LASIK eye surgery. You right. never do that. Yep. Thank God. Yep. Well, the final destination in particular is all about that, that idea. Very relatable things or places that you go. And every time you go there or see that thing, you have to think about the scene you saw. So like a lot of people bring up lumber trucks as as the final destination thing or like tanning beds is another one it's yeah. it's hard to see a lumber truck without thinking about what might yeah. happen mm-hmm. driving behind one on the highway no thank no. you i'm passing it <laughs> <laughs> all right i think we gotta let these two go oh but my goodness adam and zach that was amazing I love this idea of how horror movies ruin everyday things. And I think when it comes to our film, we're in a good spot. Zach and Adam said, when when we think of an idea, we have to think about something that we ruin. Uh, And this, I think, could possibly ruin patio doors. For finally. For the the flimsy, weird way they lock. Yeah. And the sliding door itself, like all of that kind of stuff. Even when they're locked, they don't feel that locked. Yeah, they're not a deadbolt. They're usually... A lot of viewing. There's usually a lot of glass, a lot of viewing area there. Like you don't feel safe when you close. You're like still face to face. Like, hi. Yes. Yeah. It could ruin patio doors. So that's good. That's great on the writing front. But as for directing, Zach and Adam set a really nice, healthy example of what a directing team can be. But they don't have to also act in the films they're making, which is why we finally came to this conclusion. So uh, uh, originally, all three of us were gonna were gonna direct three headed monster style, um, and then we decided that uh, uh, one director might be a, a bit better. So um, I was uh, chosen as that director, particularly probably because I'm I'm I played the least amount of acting in the in the thing itself. But also, I think I, I would I want to do. I think it'll be fun and um, a, a challenge, and I uh, would like to rise to that challenge and, and do it. And uh, thank you for your trust, both of you. Welcome. Don't you break it. You break (laughs) it, you bought it, buddy. (laughs) So we've got our director, untested, reluctant, scared newcomer, Mark Chavez. Me. Great. Now I just have to make a shot list, something I've never done, and storyboards, something I can't do, and have meetings, lots of meetings with a cinematographer and a sound operator and an editor and a colorist, whatever that is, all in the span of, um, you see, two weeks. Awesome. And on top of that, I have to direct my fellow actors who are also my co-hosts. So that'll be fun. Oh, and speaking of actors, how does one do horror acting? Watch out for the nose flaring on any close-ups when you're doing like panicked, <laughs> panicked breathing. That's next time on Let's Make a Horror. Let's Make a Horror is a production of CBC Podcasts and Kelly and Kelly, created by Kelly and Kelly, hosted by Ryan Beal, Mark Chavez, and Maddie Kelly. This episode was written and produced by Dave Shumka and Chris Kelly. For Kelly and Kelly, the executive producers are Lauren Berkovich and Pat Kelly. Associate producer, Rebecca Peng. For CBC, Anna Ashite is the coordinating producer. Jeff Turner is the senior producer. The executive producer is Chris Oak. And RF Narani is the director of CBC Podcasts. Our theme song is by Chris Kelly. Cosmo? Cosmo? Cosmo?